proposed revisions that always seem to involve less respect for the rights of free nations and less freedom for the individual. These matters would be difficult under any circumstances. They are further complicated by a trend in Western countries away from global engagement and democratic confidence. Parts of Europe have developed an identity crisis. We have seen insolvency, economic stagnation, youth unemployment, anger about immigration, resurgent ethno-nationalism and deep questions about the meaning and durability of the European Union. America is not immune from these trends. In recent decades, public confidence in our institutions has declined. Our governing class has often been paralyzed. The American dream of upward mobility seems out of reach for some who feel left behind in a changing economy. Bigotry seems emboldened. Politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. Now, as you may know, my running mate, Tim, is Catholic and went to Jesuit schools. And one of the things he and I have talked about is this idea from the Jesuits of the Magis, the more, the better. Welcome, everybody. We got another reading of Code Word Barbalon today again. Our second meeting of the day on this Tuesday, April 24th, 2018. Hello, Yerk. Hello, Romerica. <laughs> yes, this is Romerica. That's right. The second greetings, beast of the book of from Revelation. Europe. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Belgium, more specifically. Yes. Small kingdom. Belgium. Yeah. And filled with, I think, 11 and a half million people, of which I sometimes have the impression uh, 11 and a half million minus two, my mother and me, are all Jesuits. <laughs> yeah and you know the same can be said about america almost too you know yeah but then let's not speak about jesuits let's speak about freemasons yeah that's right that's much <laughs> more specific also because that brings us of course back to Cold back World to Babylon, the reading chapter uh chapter what is it 39, 39 was it? for the moment yeah for 39 39 we have come to the subchapter called Fraternity Within a Fraternity, Crowley's, mm. Crowley's Law, on page 393 for everyone who is reading along in their own copy of the book. And without any further um, hindrance, I would say, yeah. let us start. Please, do. And let us read. <clears throat> because even the first sentence is already worth of a comment. It says, Freemasonry is not merely a secretive society. It is a society with diabolical and unspeakable secrets. The, the same thing can be said about the Jesuit order, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, Compagnie de Jesus, or Company of Jesus, or uh, Society of Jesus, Sociedad de Jesus, whatever they're going to call themselves. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That also is a secret society with diabolical and unspeakable secrets. Why? Well, because the Jesuits rule Freemasonry. So Freemasonry can only be a shadow of its mother. Jesuits, Jesuitism, I'd say. Oh, sure. The mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. Ring a bell? Yeah. Yeah. Also. Right. There we go. Now, membership in Freemasonry, of course, need not be kept secret. Nevertheless, uh, because it's, you know when you have this ring and all that stuff, it's uh, very hard to keep it secret. Mm -hmm. But everything that is concerning that society has to be kept secret. Nevertheless, many lodges still do not publish their list of members. The initial degrees of Freemasonry consist of three steps. Entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason for the third degree. It is at this latter level that most Freemasons remain in uh, remain in or leave the lodge. Thus, most Masons have no, N-O, no idea, not a clue of the true nature of their lodge. 
but her. Here, ignorance is no bliss. No, let me tell you, ignorance in these kind of, uh, in, in, regarding these kind of matters, never is bliss. Mm -mm. Master Masons are told that the third degree is the completion of Freemasonry. The Lodge tells the lower Masons that the Master Mason of third degree is equivalent to the 32nd degree. This falsehood, which I have heard repeated in my, with my own ears, exposes the true character of the hierarchy of the Lodge. It is a temple of deception and dissembling. Such lies can be found put out by Masons all across the Internet. The vast majority of Masons will never be invited to take the higher degrees, which is where the real Kabbalah is disclosed. Most of those initiated into Freemasonry leave at Master Mason level, effectively becoming lapsed Masons. This reality reflects the difficulties of them accepting what is revealed to them about the inner workings of their lodge. The truth is that the Master Masons are quote-unquote tilers, mere sentries of the lodge. Albert Pike confirms this in his advice to those admitted to the Royal Arch. Quote, if you have been disappointed in the first three degrees as you have received them, remember that symbols were used not to reveal, but symbols were used to conceal uh, and not to conceal. No, to conceal. Well, what am I reading here? No, no, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I was, I, I was making the sentence a little bit more interesting, and then all of a sudden I saw a nut in there, and I have something in my eyes here, you know. It's, it's right. getting, <laughs> I, I read with my art, artificial light again, and I have to wait a oh, half hour. Oh, yeah, it's then dark Then the sun there. is completely down, then the sun mm -hmm. is completely down, and I have to close, I have to close the shades here, because otherwise the mosquitoes are coming in. Uh, anyway, yeah, I know let, me re let me repeat this last quote from Albert Pike, when what he admitted to the Royal Arch. Quote, If you have been disappointed in the first three degrees as you have received them, remember that symbols were used not to reveal, but symbols were used to conceal. Unquote. Yet not one Mason in 10,000 is aware of this fact. Albert Pike adds, quote, The blue degrees, i.e. up to Master Mason, the first degrees before that, are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Parts of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. The true explications, as opposed to explanations, the true explications, as opposed to explanations, very subtle word playing here, were reserved for the adepts and princes of masonry, for the high degrees, unquote. Oh, that wasn't a quote. <laughs> anyway, mm, Masonic right. author Manly P. Hall a himself. Footnote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It almost looks like a quote because of the footnote. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah it looks like a quote, yeah. Um, Masonic author Manly P. Hall, himself a 30 30 degree Freemason, explains this naive, uh, naivety on the part of lower Masons as being due to the fact that Freemasonry is a two dimensional organization. Hall was honored by the Scottish Rite Journal, which referred to him as, quote, the illustrious Manly P. Hall, unquote, in its September 1990 issue, and further declared him to be. Masonry's greatest philosopher. Hall said, quote, Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity, an outer organization concealing an inner brotherhood of the elect, one visible and the other invisible. The visible society is a splendid camaraderie, uh, camaraderie of free and accepted men enjoining to devote themselves to ethical educational, fraternal, patriotic, and humanitarian concerns. The invisible society is a secret and most august, meaning of majestic dignity or grandeur, fraternity, whose members are dedicated to the service of a mysterious arcanum arcandrum, uh, i.e. secret or mystery. Unquote. Now, I have to add here something, and I think 
uh, for anybody who has ever had some contact with Freemasons um, will understand what I say right now. Freemasonry is an international organization that has lodges in all countries all over the world. And as we've learned here, there is an inner circle and there is an outer circle. That outer circle, those are all these Masons who are of the first degree, maybe the second, and also, of course, of the third degree. But as we have learned, they have no knowledge of the working of the inner circle. So the point is, by keeping that outer circle oblivious to the real meaning and reason of existence of Freemasonry and the real goals about it, ever when you are going to confront a person with Freemasonry, who is himself a Freemason of the first, second, or even quote-unquote master of the third degree, you will hear but we are such a nice organization. We do in charity, we build hospitals, we build kindergartens, we make soup kitchens and we support soup kitchens and we do this and we do transport for handicapped and we do uh, charity collections for, uh, for other big charities, maybe in another state or maybe even federal. We are so wonderful people and they get you with things like um, the Rotary Club, for example. Uh, the Rotaries are only an entrance into Freemasonry. So when you confront someone who is a first, second or third degree Mason who has no idea of the inner workings, the problem is that they just don't want to understand that. But because they are on the outside, this uh, quote-unquote noble, at least they seem that noble to the outside, that is why they drag people into that. You have to see this like a spider's net. Mm -hmm. You know, the fly just sees the spider's net and thinks, oh, I can rest there a little bit. But her senses don't tell her that once she sits in that spider's net, she will cleave to it. She's glued to it. She cannot escape anymore. And when you are in the hands of the Freemasons, they make the decision whether you are being an initiate of the first, second, or third degree or maybe even you can go into much higher degrees, which only means that who higher, the higher you go, the more satanic you are becoming. And that is something that they don't tell you in the beginning. So they need this very, very big organization worldwide, this very, very big and widespread outer court to attract other people and to work for their reputation. The real reputation is only to be found in works like Manly P. Hall's book, in Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, and in books like Cold World Babylon, and in the book of Robeson, which we spoke about and, uh, uh, and uh, discussed already a few times uh, during this book reading here. Yeah? And I think this is very important that we understand this, that we do not get caught by the... Um, by the honey they lay on the altar court to go there and to be trapped because honey is very sticky, even though it is quite sweet. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have something to add there, Brad? Oh, you know, I was just looking up something while you were doing your comment, Jörg, because earlier uh, in the, the previous page, was mentioned something that triggered something old for me, and I just couldn't help but look up in this dictionary the word arch because mm -hmm. the royal arch and the reason, ah, and it's a vague reason, and I really can't come to a, a concrete um, word right now other than um, for some reason I, I thought that arch was associated with the Templars. Why do you think McDonald's has this gold yeah, arch as that symbol? Right. <laughs> exactly what I wanted to say. Yes. <clears throat> that's that's right. secrets out in the open, Brad. Mm -hmm. That's that right. Is, that's how it works. That is, yeah, that is this uh, typical thing about the Kabbalah. You know? mm -hmm. That's right. That they are that they are using everywhere. Yeah, yeah. that's why this corporate um, you know, corporate uh, government um, is so easily hid 
is uh, that we adopt those principles into our quote unquote wealth or rather mm-hmm. the debt that we exchange because we don't really have wealth. That's, that's the real, um, what is that word again? This, uh, ah, this is this alchemy where they supposedly, you know, the pretended science of turning, uh, something into gold. What was it? Turning elements into gold, you know? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, like uh, turning lead into gold. And right, all that so stuff. the true yeah. alchemist is the one that turns paper currency, gold, you know, into gold. And they got us, yeah. they got us hooked. And, and, yeah. and, you know, this has been going on for so long. And mm-hmm. we know that Jesus was really upset in the temple when he fashioned a whip and started going after the money changers on, in the temple, you know. Mm-hmm. And... uh calling him a den of thieves because he knew what would happen. And here we are, 2,000 years yeah. later. What's changed? Here we are, yeah. I like, I, 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 I like your expression that you said, corporate government. Yeah, that's right. Because that's what that's, this is. That's just, yeah, but that's just another expression for fascism, you know? Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. And, and fascism came from this... Uh, this uh, Italian reunification, maybe. Um, I've been looking at that too, you know, from 1870 to 1929, this period of, uh, you know, the, the deadly wound being healed. It's incredible. Um, I'm sorry to be so vague, but that's kind of where my head is at right now. <laughs> No, it's, it's all right because, you know, Benito Mussolini, the Duce, yeah. the leader of the Italian fascist movement, he said fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it is the merger of corporate and state power. That's right. So when you are speaking of corporate government, you are speaking, of course, of a fascist government. Mm-hmm. But and that's what fascist have. government, to, to call it a fascist government, Brad, that is not politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh, it's a it's a democracy. <laughs> it's a democracy. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> no, I call it a hypocrisy, but that's just Brett speaking. Okay, cool. That was my comments. Okay. So, what is this mysterious arc- uh, arcanum arcandrum? The superficial observer of masonry, and that is what most people are, they are superficial observers, will never know what Freemasonry is or seeking to achieve. This is hidden from even the lower masons. As I said, the first, the second, the third degree, they have no clue what's it all about. But the illustrious Manly P. Hall reveals it all. Let Hall define this mystery the heart and soul of the invisible society of higher masonry. Quote, When a mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. Unquote. Yes, the seething energies of Lucifer is the secret behind Freemasonry, the mystery of the craft. Doubt it not, Satan is the grand master of the lodge. Why are these facts not more well known? Because every Mason takes a vow to hide and to conceal the truth of Masonry from the outside world. So, For example, in the dramatic climax to the Masonic initiation rite, the Mason is required to take a terrible vow of secrecy, the violation of which which would result in a deadly and hostile current set in motion by the secret agents of the Lodge. If he ever reveals the secrets given to him, he might fall slain and paralyzed. Thus we see that most Freemasons of the lower ranks are intentionally deceived. 
intentionally deceived like all of mankind is. They are deliberately misled even about these things that are revealed to them. The symbols of the Lodge are given fanciful and high-sounding interpretations not unlike the Roman Catholic Church. Many well-meaning men who are members of Freemasonry have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of the inner dualism and the diabolism of this secret society. In fact, the Masonic Commander General Albert Pike admitted cryptically, quote, Fictions are necessary to the people, and the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it, to contemplate it in all its brilliance, unquote. Now, what does he mean, is the question that P.D. Stewart asks. And I say, when Albert Pike speaks here about the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it in all its brilliance, I say, you are looking for the truth in the wrong place. Because actually, when you find the truth, the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. But that truth is only to be found in Jesus Christ. And here we are dealing with secret societies, unbiblical teachings. It is unbiblical to hide anything. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. What other is a secret society but a society of lying, conniving jerks? Now, what does Albert Pike mean? Pike explains, quote, Masonry, like all the religions, oh, let's stop here. I thought we were just speaking about Freemasonry. Why is Freemasonry all of a sudden a religion? Did you know that, Brett? Oh, yes. We are talking, we are talking here about another, quote, unquote, denomination. That's right, an ecumenical one, Yerk. <laughs> yeah. So we are talking about a religion. Oh, the oh. devil's got a real scheme, doesn't he? So we are talking about a sect, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Masonry, the quote says, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, <clears throat> conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages, or the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light, and draw them, and draw them away from it. Unquote. I will only respond to this declaration of Pike with the words of the prophet Isaiah. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. As we read in the starting of this chapter from Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20, this is how we close this chapter. The only thing that I regret a little bit that the author didn't go into, he names this whole chapter and this last subchapter has to do something with Crowley. And Crowley's oh, law. Crowley's but, law, yeah, right, right, but, right. But we don't learn anything about Alistair Crowley himself in here. Mm, that is odd, isn't it? And I thought that would be the case because I learned some years ago when I was uh, listening to Alan Watt uh, from the website... Um, uh, What's uh, what's his website called? Of Alan Watt. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it it it, uh, it, it slipped me for the moment. Um, That's all it, right. It, You're no problem. It's an interesting website. I I just can't come to the name for the moment. Well, I just think it's interesting. At the beginning of the chapter, he mentions Alistair Crowley, and he says Alistair yeah. Crowley once wrote, "The ignorance of the Masons is quite boundless." <laughs> Crowley was one, himself one of the highest-ranking Freemasons of... Cutting through the Matrix, sorry. There, 
There we go. Cutting Got through it. the matrix. That's Good. the website of Alan. Good. Good. Yeah, I haven't visited that website. I don't think. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I, I was listening to him for I don't know, half a year maybe, uh, and I have oh, a video uploaded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have a video uploaded um, on my uh, on my YouTube channels. I, I think on both, uh, at least at the second YouTube channel, Alan Watt, Alan Watt, cutting through the matrix, an interview that was done with Alan, uh, with Alan, I say, with Alex Jones. Oh, but Alex Jones only says about twenty words in that whole interview. For the rest, it's completely Alan Watts speaking. Hmm. And that interview, still today, I consider a very, very interesting eye opener. Oh, I had to see that then. Oh, didn't you see that? No, that's that's not. two hours long. I have it on my second YouTube channel. Okay, I'll look for and, it. And uh, when you when you tip in Alan Watt like I just did, you you are led directly to uh, this video, it, it is shown there, so my video is quite famous. I sent you the link here on Skype, Brett. Thank you. And you can have a look at it. I will. Um, uh, it good. is said, uh, Alan Watt, Cutting Through the Matrix interview. And the description, I'm going to read the description for you for a moment. Um, it says, researcher Alan Watt features in this exclusive interview in which he discusses how the same laws are enacted at the same time across different countries under the structure of global governance. What explains in detail how the people of the world are moved around by the elite like a domesticated herd of animals by a series of contrived crises and quote-unquote revolutions, be they cultural, political, sexual, or musical, so that the controllers can manipulate human behavior to the outcome they require? What reveals how, how the population are kept in a constant state of panic and terror so that authority figures who speak with confidence are then more willingly trusted, using psychological shock and awe to generate fear and helplessness by bombarding the population with a myriad of different threats that they cannot personally cope with and so turn to the state for reassurance and leadership. In this fascinating in-depth exploration of the human psyche, what discusses how this helplessness uh, in, uh, is artificially steam-volved through the use of sports, where men are given a tribal team that they can identify with and cheer on, providing them with some sense of success in their own personal lives, when in the real world, they are going nowhere, and sports are merely a substitute to keep them distracted from their own enslavement. What explains how women were given high fashion and accessible prices as a similar form uh, for substitute and how drugs, sex, free love, hyper-promiscuity and destructive lifestyles were also encouraged through music as a means of misdirecting the natural rebellious tendencies of youth. The ultimate goal of this process is to demolish the family unit, divide and conquer so that humanity may be more easily ruled and oppressed by the state as vulnerable individuals with no family tribe to stand up and defend them. Alan Watt continues to divulge his fascinating in-depth insights into how culture is created from the top down and used by the elite to manipulate and pervert natural human instincts towards their own ends. Every change in culture, right down to fashion and music, points out, uh, points out what citing Plato had to be authorized and promoted from the top. This science of mass mind control is still taught today by the insiders and mediums such as television are used as weapons of social control to prevent humanity from ever realizing its full potential. What talks about how the elite technocrats plan for the long term in 50, 100 and even 150 year cycles in which to implement the different aspects of their agenda and how each cultural shift was deliberately timed to be implemented at a certain time. The current cultural bombardment surrounds the emergence of neo-eugenics, neo with big foundations and organizations like Optimum Population Trust pushing the idea that humans are superfluous, virus-like, and therefore absolutely worthless. 
What discusses how sperm counts across Europe and America have dropped at an alarming rate of up to 80% over the past 50 years, and how the media's complete ignorance of this crisis proves that it was authorized as a deliberate program of depopulation. What traces this program back to its origins in the 1950s, where synthetic female hormones like estrogen were put in baby foods by companies like Procter & Gamble, as well as baby milk bottles washed with bisphenol A, a very, the very substance that attracts male genitalia and prevents it from developing properly. What also outlines how bisphenol A in women's cosmetic products contributes to toxifying their bodies, leading to an environment for male babies that leads them to have reduced sperm count or even become sterile. The foundation of the agenda can be discovered in the writings of people like Bertrand Russell and the Huxley brothers, who talked about the need to sterilize the masses as far back as the 1930s. The Huxley brothers, just a little insert from me, you have Aldous Huxley, who is the author of um, Brave New World, and you have his brother, uh, I just don't remember his uh, Christian name, but his, his first name for the mm -hmm. moment, and he was the first uh, uh, chairman of uh, UNESCO. Julian, Julian Huxley. Mm. And Bertrand Russell, well, I can read you some quotes of Bertrand Russell if you like to. Would you like to? Oh, sure, of course. You got him there. Uh, Go I'm, for I'm it. Just, I'm just asking. You have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just caught me off guard with this. Your, <laughs> did you write this? Uh, no, I don't think that I wrote this. I think oh, okay. This no, 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 no problem. I, I just think this is really fascinating, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to read to you two quotes from Bertrand Russell. Um, uh, they are from his book, The Impact of Science on Society. Yeah? Uh, and of course, you have to understand science as not biblical science, but the science of the Antichrist. Uh, he lived between 1872 and 1970, Bertrand Russell. The first quote reads as follows. Gradually, by selective breeding, the congenital differences between rulers and ruled will increase until they become almost different species. A revolt of the plebs would become as unthinkable as an organized insurrection of sheep against the practice of eating mutton. Heavy, huh? Eh? Oh, man. The second one reads, Diet, injections and injunctions will combine from a very mm. early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of believers that the authorities consider desirable. And any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. Why do you think they start vaccinating babies right after birth? That's one of them. Hmm. Okay. So that's Bertrand Russell. Continuing for just another paragraph in the description of that video. What also divulges how the elite's ultimate goal for every human allowed to be born is for them to serve the state and be deceived into accepting this enslavement as a natural form of existence. Aren't we there yet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. The elite's greatest fear is that the quote-unquote inferiors will outbreed the quote-unquote superiors, which is why they continually push neo-eugenics and are obsessed with interbreeding and keep their own genetics intellectually pure. And uh, now comes a little bit comment of me to that video where I say, I absolutely in no way support Alex Jones or any of his affiliates. Yeah. But this video, <laughs> but this video is not to be found on Alan Watts' website, so I had to take it from there. And I took it from uh, yeah. in the time uh, Alex Jones. Yep. And uh, I uploaded this on the 9th of March 2013. So that's five years ago already. And I think it is also on my main channel, but this is on the, on the, uh, on the second channel, and it has 28,000 views here. 
And I still consider this video very important for people who are going to wake up. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with God. That is the problem with Alan Watt, of course. He is not a Christian. He doesn't mention God. And he, of course, in my views also, is controlled opposition and working for them by not telling mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. But what he tells here is very significant. And the point that I bring up, Alan Watt, to come back to the book Code World Babylon is, and because there was no mentioning of Alistair Crowley himself in what we just read in chapter 39, I learned through Alan Watt, and you can think of him whatever you want, but he has very, very well documented, uh, he makes very, very well documented statements, statements. And I learned of him that he said that Alistair Crowley was involved in the invention of the television. And when you remember what I just read to you in this description of this video about the television, and you know that um, that quote from Alan La, uh, from from uh, Anton Lavey. Does anybody remember that quote of Anton Lavey concerning oh, yeah. the television? Vaguely, yeah, yeah vaguely. Not okay. enough to quote it. <laughs> okay, the quote reads: "Television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new satanic religion." The television set, or satanic family altar, has grown more elaborate since the early 1950s, from the tiny fuzzy screen to huge entertainment centers covering entire walls with several TV monitors. Now it comes. What started as an innocent respite from every day's life has become in itself a replacement for real life for millions a major religion for the masses. That is from Anton LaVey's The Devil's Notebook on page 86. And Alan Watt was also speaking on the, te on the television right here, what we've just read in this description. Yeah, Let me just see that I find that easily. I have to do a search. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The science of mass mind control is still taught today by the insiders and mediums such as television are used as weapons of social control to prevent humanity from ever realizing its full potential. We spoke already earlier, I think, in the reading of this book of entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. And I gave you the explanation of what entertainment means, right? Sure. You still remember that? Not by heart, but uh, <laughs> I know the basics of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me just see that I can find that here. Why doesn't he find, find entertainment? Did I? Oh, yeah. Okay. When you. Ah, there's one letter. Computers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was my fault. There was oh. there was one letter, there was one letter in there that was not correct. There, there was see. an R, an R slipping into my typing of entertainment. So, let's see here. What does entertainment mean? Enter means to come in, to be invited in. Tain means to possess or to hold and maintain, and meant. Is, uh, means to keep in the state of mind you're in, meaning keep you mentally in the state of, in that case, possession. Yeah? Television is a possession, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and Alan Watt says, this science of mass mind control, television is mind control, mass mind control. Yeah, that's right. How many Americans don't watch television every night? How many Germans don't watch television every night? Don't you have sometimes these programs where they tell you, oh, we have had so many and so many viewers of this program right. because this was such a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. Well, in Germany, those are sometimes um, 20, 25 million of 82 million inhabitants watching this one program watching the television and being entertained, being possessed by a mind that is not their own. Yeah? 
mm-hmm. and being massively mind controlled through television. And you want to hear the most interesting example of how television is mind control? It's your history, Brad. Yeah. September 11th, 2001. Oh, sure. Yeah. That yeah. was absolutely mass mind control. Oh, yeah. Because everybody saw 9-11 in the television. Yeah. The few people who saw it live and who were speaking of explosions and no planes and all that stuff. Yeah. All these people you don't find anymore, do you? No. But no. you only have quote unquote witnesses on television. It was a massive mind control um, action they mm. did on September 11th, 2001. Yeah. And uh, this yeah. mind control is still yeah. going on. Yeah. And for yeah. some people, you have sports. And for some people, you have quiz shows. And for some people, you have dance shows. And for some people, you have musical shows. And for some people, you have news. And for some people, you have this. And for some people, you have that. It's all mind control. Right. right. It takes you away from the word of God. Yes, it does. You do everything but read and study the Bible and get to the truth, the truth that will set you free. Remember what we just read in this chapter before mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that we were speaking about the so-called truth, yeah? Mm-hmm. That they lead you into the truth. What truth? Well, the truth within what they consider the truth, but not the truth of the Bible, not the truth that Jesus Christ will make you free with. And you will never find that truth when you adhere further to the television and all that stuff. No. So, Brett, right. I think I think you can, uh, and you probably will, put this link into the description box of this video. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. If you haven't seen it, I can advise you to watch it. I, I will watch it, watch it probably when again. we get done with our, our session today. Yeah, it's, it's really an interesting video. I mean, it's two hours long. And uh, let me assure you, Alan Jones says, I don't know, I didn't count them, but 30 words, 40 words, and that's it. For the Alex rest, Jones, yeah, all... right, right. Yeah, sorry, it. what did I say? Oh, Alan, but that's no big deal. Yeah, yeah, Alex Jones, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's in there for 30 or 40 words or whatever. Right. He's just an introducer of Alan Watt. For the rest, he's quiet. He doesn't ask questions or what. It's Alan Watt yes. speaking all the time. And what he has to say is quite interesting. And coming back to that, through Alan Watt, I learned in one of his shows that he said that Alistair Crowley was involved in the invention of the television. Mm. And I have absolutely no doubt that being true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking of the other interview that Alex Jones did with Chris Pinto. Did you ever hear about that one? No, not that I know of. I know of interviews with Chris Pinto, right. but never with Alex Jones. And I, I probably think wouldn't even watch that. So I think there was one, and I thought I remember hearing someone talk about it. Now, I haven't watched it the entire thing, but it just rings a bell. It would be interesting to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I mean, I I don't know if somebody like Alan, uh, like uh, Chris Pinto, yeah. sells out to be interviewed with Alan Jones. I already have my suspicions, you know. Right, right, right. Well, I don't know much about Chris Pinto, but I'll tell you, he did make several really good movies. One of them being absolutely. One of them uh, being the hidden, uh, the hidden face of the founding fathers. Uh, and, a uh, lamp in the dark. A lamp in the dark. That's the one. That's the terrace the and the wheat, the second yes. part. And there's there's even coming out a third part of that series, A Lamp in the Dark, I think this year. Is there really? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I saw previews of that last year or so. Oh, I didn't even know about that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah uh, you can research that in your spare time, but yeah. for the moment, you're yeah. still reading this book here. Yeah. Yeah? And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I'm sorry for for getting. Uh, uh, distracted by this uh, Alan Watt thing, but I just thought that would be interesting to mention because uh, P.D. Stewart doesn't mention anything of uh, Alistair Crowley with one word in this uh, in this chapter. Yeah, that and is a little I, disappointing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. no, it? It's disappointing on the one end. It's not disappointing on the other. You know, right. I right. don't really want to learn about the Satanists and all that stuff. Yeah, that's but, true. But it would have been interesting to get a little bit more background about the doings of Alistair Crowley because he was, of course, a high-level Freemason. 
uh, well, probably considered the considered uh, one and one of the most, if not the wickedest, the 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 wicked, the most wicked man ever to live, or something. I don't know. Yeah, wasn't it his mother who called him who called him the beast? Yes, right. Oh, well, I mean, that's pretty bad. I I think so. If my mother would call me the beast, I think I would have to do some serious thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh. But of course, when anyway, that's sold to the devil. You don't think at all. <laughs> I mean, you're just possessed, right? Yeah. Anyway, we still have a few minutes left uh, before the hour hits, and uh, I suggest that we go into the next chapter on page 396 of the book, which is called Knights Templarism, Masonry, and the Youth of Demolay. Uh, chapter mm -hmm. 40. Demolay, uh -huh. by the way, for, for, for people who do not know, uh, de Molay was the arrested uh, master of the Knights Templar, and uh, he was the one who was uh, burned on a on the stake in Paris. And his last wish was that they turn the stake in that way that he could look at Notre Dame Cathedral. Mm. Notre Dame Cathedral uh, is also very much uh, beloved by the Jesuits, of course. But he wanted to face Notre Dame Cathedral because of the ghouls that are outside on that church. And one of the ghouls outside of the church is Baphomet. And he wanted to stare at Baphomet while burning on the stake. And they granted him that wish. So, Knight Templarism, Masonry, and the Youth of Demolay. We start with a quote from Robeson's book, Proofs of a Conspiracy. Quote, the mighty secret was this. When the order of Knights Templars was abolished, some worthy persons escaped. Every true mason was a Knight Templar. Unquote. And before we even go into this, the Jesuits are the revived Knights Templars. The history of the medieval order of the Knights Templar is so well known that there seems little point in providing a comprehensive account here. We shall focus on the handover from Templarism to Freemasonry. What the Crusades, <clears throat> with the Crusades at an end in the Holy Land, the original charter of the Knights Templar Order came to an end. And let me just insert a little comment here. When anybody thinks the Knights Templars were noble men, you know what the Roman Catholic Church did because they needed people who were fighting their fights, who were going to fight to, to quote-unquote free Jerusalem from the Muslims? Huh? Mm -hmm. Did you know what they did? They opened the prisons in Europe and promised everybody, every murder, every, uh, every pedophile, every, uh, every rapist who came out of that prison they granted a, um, a general uh, pardon, and when they went to war for the Pope, yeah, they had to do that. And when they came back and they had killed a lot of people, proven they were given a noble status. All the, uh, all the noble bloodlines of Europe are based on not only the Knights Templars, but always based on military achievements for the Roman Catholic Church. Because there haven't been any noble lines in the beginning of our time counting, in the year quote-unquote zero, when everything started, there were no noble families at that time. Those came later, and those were all based on the achievements they had in fighting for the Antichrist, his wars. And the Knights Templars did not only go and fight Jerusalem because they wanted to get Jerusalem back from the Muslims, who were first getting it for the Pope and then saw the Pope as an infidel and didn't want to give it to him. No, no, no. On their way, they went through France and they fought the Albigenses and they fought the Huguenots and they fought the Waldenses and try to exterminate those true Bible-believing Christian folks who are described in the Bible as 
the bride that hides for 1260 years in the wilderness where God has prepared a place for her. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That also did the Knights Templars do. It was a crusade, but not only or exclusively against Islam, but also against Bible-believing Christians in the south of France. Why do you think the Knights Templars are still, are still set today in the south of France? When you go to the border of Spain, you have a, a, a little city there that is called um, uh, Perpignan. Mm. Perpignan is about 20, 25 kilometers about 15 miles away from the Spanish border. And there, the Templars still today have vineyards. I sell wines of those. I sell wines with the Templar insignia, uh, insignia mm -hmm. on. I would doubt huh? it. Yeah. It's, a sweet, it's a sweet red wine that's called Banyuls. That mm. is like a port wine. You know, probably port right. wine. Oh, yeah. Come, coming from sure. Portugal, you know. Yep. That, is, that is a wine that is... Um, uh, that has been added a little bit of alcohol uh, because port wine has 20 degrees of alcohol. So that is a fortified wine, a natural sweet wine fortified with alcohol. And the same you have in Banyuls, and Banyuls comes from Perpignan. And the Templars have their vineyards still there since almost 1,000 years. Yeah? And they got all that land as a payment from the Pope because of their achievements in the Crusades. Maybe that is something no, uh, people have never heard of. Mm -hmm. Anyway, with the Crusades at an end in the Holy Land, the original charter of the Knights Templar Order came to an end. Further, having fallen out of favor with the people, due in no small measure to their abominable rites, R-I-T-E-S, rituals that is, mm -hmm. The Knights Templar Order was temporarily without a justification. By the decree of the Councils of Yen in 1312, a considerable portion of their assets were conferred upon the Knights of St. John. By way of disambiguation, this latter order is also known as the Knights of Rhodes. Uh, you remember Cecil Rhodes, yes, Rhodes Scholar, right. oh, wow. the Cavaliers of Malta, and the Order of St. John of Jerusalem was by a general degree the, a decree in the papacy of Clement V, annexed and incorporated into the Knights of Malta. Mm. And by the way, St. John of Jerusalem, that is not dealing as most people think, that is the exoteric knowledge of the Apostle John that deals with the uh, John the Baptist who is considered uh, as a figure of the devil for most of these initiated papal knighthoods. For more on modern Templarism, the reader is referred to Revised Knights Templarism Illustrated, where you can read more on that, what we've just read here. Now, the official story is that the Knights Templar Order was completely destroyed when its leader, Jacques de Molay, was condemned to death along with about 15,000 Templars in Spain and France. But the reality was that many Templars escaped as they had quote-unquote spies in high places who quote, warned them that trouble was coming, unquote. Many Templars in England escaped persecution by fleeing into Scotland, where the unsettled condition of that country prevented their discovery or capture. In fact, Count Mirabeau, a famous Freemason and Illuminatus, said, quote, The Rose Croix Masons, that's Red Cross Masons, of the 17th century were only the ancient order of the Templars' secret, perpetual, mystical, Kabbalistic, and magical. Unquote. The reorganization of the Templars under the cover of Freemasonry occurred between the years of the Templar arrest. 1307, and the final dissolution in 1312, ample time and opportunity for an underground system to reorganize itself. Albert Pike wrote in this regard, quote, The order disappeared at once. Its estates and wealth were confiscated, 
and it seemed to have ceased to exist. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it lived under other names and governed by unknown chiefs, revealing itself only to those who, in passing through a series of degrees, had proven themselves worthy to be entrusted with the dangerous secret. Unquote. And it continues with another quote. The end of the drama is well known, wrote Pike. Jacques de Molay and his fellows perished in the flames. But before his execution, the chief of the doomed order organized and instituted that afterward came to be called the, uh, the uh, organized and instituted what afterward came to be called the occult, hermetic or Scottish rite masonry. In the gloom of his prison, the Grand Master created four metropolitan lodges at Naples for the east, at Edinburgh for the west, at Stockholm for the north, and at Paris for the south. The initials of his name, Jacques de Molay, J.D.M., found in the same order in the first three degrees, are but one of the many internal and cogent, uh, cogent proofs that such was the origin of modern Freemasonry. Unquote. It is for that reason that in the first three degrees of Scottish Rite Masonry, the name of Jacques de Molay is memorialized as J.D.M. At the initiation of a third degree, the Scottish Rite, the very last words which Jacques de Molay uttered from the pyre of his execution are used. Awakam, Adonai, revenge them. O oh Lord. We have the word of Professor Robeson that quote Baron, Baron Hunde, that's a German one. Hunde means Hund is a dog. But Baron Hunde, a gentleman of honorable character, got acquainted with the Earl of Kilmarnock and some other gentlemen, and learned from them that they had some wonderful secrets in their lodges. The mighty secret was this. When the Order of Knights Templars was abolished by Philip the Fair and cruel, cruelly persecuted, some worthy persons, uh, who determines which is worthy or not, <laughs> escaped and took refuge in the highlands of Scotland, where they concealed themselves in caves. These persons possessed the true secrets of masonry, which had always been in that order having been acquired by the knights during their services in the East from the pilgrims whom they occasionally protected. The secret was that every true mason was a knight templar. Frightful Jesuitisms. The well-known Templar emblem, the black and white chessboard battle banner, or Beosant, is found transcribed in the checkerboard floor pattern of the Masonic Lodge. At the initiation of a candidate into the modern Knights Templar degree, the initiate is addressed by the eminent commander as follows, quote, Pilgrims, these liberations in honor of the illustrations Grand Masters of Ancient Craft Freemasonry are taking an acknowledgement of our connection with and veneration for that ancient and honorable institution, unquote. Today, the workings and rites of the Knights Templar Order are reinstalled within one of the highest degrees in Freemasonry. Indeed, the 32nd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry is the Order of the Knights Templar called the Master of the Royal Secret. In the Southern Jurisdiction and Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret in the Northern Jurisdiction of the United States of America. This same degree is also the highest degree, the non plus ultra, in the New York Rite System of Masonry, where it is referred to as Order of Knights Templar. And according to Lady Queensborough, quote, the first Knights Templar Order, founded in 118 by Hugh de Payan, had 13 degrees. So has its modern successor, unquote which also has the emblem of the cross inside the crown, which we can see in the front cover of the book. Mm. So there's a bunch of footnotes here, Jörg. I've been looking over ever since uh, the second page of this chapter. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, wow, um, uh, this is uh, a lot. This is pretty heavy duty stuff. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, just to give you an example, I have such a hard time um, acquiring this knowledge about these uh, historical secret societies is is that there's so much um it takes a lot of time to d- discover these things and and it just i don't know just um uh, everything seems to go against it here in this country <laughs> you know uh you know the, the the minute you start uh discovering things in history and things like that think and then uh people uh well, you know, you might talk about it with some friends and things like that. They look at you like you're half crazy or something. <laughs> yeah. Like they really do, heads. you know. Yeah? Yeah, I, I believe that, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that occurs in, in Europe, too, to some degree, you know. There's something about, um, you know, the, the, the society we live in that it, it's, it, it doesn't like to be reminded about the simplicity of things, you know. No. No, no, everybody has to be complicated. You have to study <laughs> many, many years in school to get the knowledge, you know? Yeah, uh, that's it. No, no, that's no, it. It, it, cannot, it cannot be that easy. Can't be that simple, no. But, but the Bible is easy. The Bible is simple. The Bible is to be understood by a fourth grader. Yeah, that's right. So this footnote number two uh, in relation to the very top of Page 397, the official story is the Knights Templar Order was completely destroyed when its reader, Jack de Molay, was condemned to death. And then we have mm-hmm. another footnote, number three, on that word, along with 15,000 Templars in Spain and France. So the number two footnote says... Uh, no, this is a French word. I can't... Pronounce. Yeah, I, I, I help you. I help Thank you there. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I appreciate that. Le, le tombeau de Jacques de Molay, the 22nd and last Grand Master of the Templars, was given the Masonic name of Hiram, the name of the murdered builder of the Temple of Solomon. Mm. And you know what they say in the Islam about Hiram Abib, right? So mm. the name of, uh, of, of de Molay here was le tombeau de Jacques de Molay. That was his full name. And uh, the third uh, footnote, shall I read that too? Sure, please. It says, uh, public indignation uh, indignation was aroused by charges of worshipping the devil in the form of an idol called Baphomet. And uh, that's what I tried to explain to you when I told you that Jacques de Molay asked for the stake to be turned, that he could look at Notre Dame, where there is a Baphomet on the outside structure of that church. Which is found in you know what that means? Paris. Yeah, I mean, well, if if I break it down, uh, it means that there are a lot of people in France who were trying to live a righteous life, and they were very upset when they, you know, I mean, yeah, well, not, not only in France. Yeah, not only in France. That's right. That's right. Europe is 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 very interconnected true and uh you know the united states was never developed over the period of time well it was but i mean it 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 this form of government government we have today is just so ridiculous but anyway i i mean you know we're basically you know i'm a european descent that that moved to this country and you know i'm here witnessing this this way of life we live here. I mean, it's just, I never really liked it all that much, but then again, you know. Brett, every American who is not a Native American that they call Indian yeah, is an imported, uh, yeah, that's right. is an imported citizen. <laughs> that's right. So we have this, uh, this quote-unquote Masonic experiment. And uh, yeah, I mean, it really is. And uh not so easy to come to that conclusion, Yurik. Um, well, to come to that conclusion is uh, is 
easier than to accept that conclusion as the truth, Brett. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is not because you see the truth that you also accept it as the truth. So I think right. it is much right. more. It's, right. it's much harder to accept the truth uh, of sure. the things that we just said instead of finding out these truths. It is, well, it is not so hard to yeah. find them out if you do no. your research. That's true. But then to accept it as the truth, that is quite hard because yeah, it is. That means that you have to admit to yourself that you had been lied to all your all your days of your life up to now. Yeah, that's it. And there yeah. are very few people who want to admit that to themselves because they think, I'm so smart, I'm so wonderful, I'm so great, I'm so studied, I know it all, I cannot have been betrayed all my life. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, they were. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have about reached an hour of this reading, uh, the second reading of today, the 24th of April here on Cold World Babylon. Isn't it true? Yeah, there's, now, right? there's one more thing. Um, yeah, please. I looked up this word in the quote here at the bottom of page 398 from Eminent Commander. Who is this? I'm sorry. Um, the initiation of a candidate into the modern Knights Templar degree. The initiate is, is addressed by the Eminent Commander as follows. Quote, Pilgrims, these libations in honor of the illust illustrious Grand Masters of Ancient Craft Freemasonry are taken in acknowledgement of our connection with and veneration for that ancient and honorable institution. And I was noticing this word, libations, so I looked it up. Yeah. And libation is the act of pouring liquor, usually wine, either on the ground or on a victim in sacrifice in honor of some deity. The Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans practiced libation. This was a solemn act and accompanied with prayer. I just found that interesting. I did yeah. not know that. Sure, interesting. I didn't know that either. I read over that word. Uh, oh, no problem. I, I couldn't help but want to look it up after I seen it. I was like, what is this? Sure. No clue. <laughs> That's great. So I think next time then we're going to continue with um, the book reading. Yeah, where were we again here? here? Uh, we finished up to, were we on page well, 399 here? I think that we are going to continue the Masonic Youth of de Molay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, the Order of de Molay. All right. Very well, Yerk. Interesting chapter. Lots to learn here. Yeah, as always. As always. And thank you, Yerk, for taking the time today, tonight. Actually, it's nighttime over there. So. Yeah take the time tonight to come together with me and i know we're not going to be able to get together tomorrow but we'll see about thursday and friday who knows great and we'll see what happens here good and uh always interesting to keep going on these studies yes and very important not to lose sight of the bible and study that first oh absolutely yep that's the whole premise of this I think that is something that should not be too short mentioned in these videos that we do when we read about all these Masonic and uh, uh, yeah, satanic, particularly uh, when we're getting to these portions of the reading because they deal with the uh, you know this this corrupt uh, the corrupted uh, form of of taking uh, the holy and mixing it with the profane. And, you know, we're living in such an incredible time of that, Yerk. It's just... No, that's right. Uh, on our modern day and age, it's really baffling that it even can exist. <laughs> <laughs> but yet it does. It serves its purpose, so to speak. The diabolical purpose, that is. But um, we know our Lord and Savior uh, died to set us free from that diabolical purpose. And that's the point. My yoke is easy, he said. Yeah, that's right. My burden is light. Yeah. 
And with that, we'll close it up, Jerk. Any final comments? No. Okay. Not this time. All right. Blessings, everybody, and our Lord and Messiah that died 2,000 years to save us from our present condition, and he will return. And no man know the day or the hour, but we surely can expect that in this life or the life to come, we will hopefully endure. And we wish you blessings in Jesus' holy name. Bye for now. That for the first time in human history, for the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows. Namely, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people, literally, it was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. Um, and I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're starting uh, now in the 21st century which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. His son Jesus is here in our midst. His bride, the church, is honored to host an event affirming the dignity of the human person and the sacredness of all human life. I think Russia is no longer a communist state, first of all. That's very important to realize. It hasn't yet defined itself, however, effectively as a democracy. It is still uncertain. We're at at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict, of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,000, 2,500 years. You didn't mention the president by name, but it was hard not to conclude that that's who you were referring to. Is that fair? I was certainly referring to the threats that we are now facing with this stated goals of this administration, which would upset the last 70 years of a new world order, which was established after World War II. 70 years based on human rights, respect for the law, uh, free trade, all of the things and aspects of this world order that took place after one of the most horrific, uh, terrible wars in history. And I'm for maintaining it. We are grateful to be citizens of one nation under God who acclaim this evening that in God we trust. Bless our two candidates, our benefactors, and those whom the L. Smith Foundation has been honored to serve for seven decades. Guide us safely home, both this evening and for all eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen.